theatre before, in 1935, she got her big break. The enormous hit she scored when she started acting in the theatre was a play which I was lucky enough to see with Mary called The Mask of Virtue. The fact that I was young and unknown, it caught the imagination of the audience. The roar of applause at the final curtain told me that the miracle had happened. I had arrived. She made a stunning debut and, of course, or they all raved about her looks but one or two had the sense to see that she could act. Vivian was, I think, very much an overnight sensation. Mask of Virtue, she got huge, huge amounts of publicity. What is amazing about her is that it wasn't just a one night off, it wasn't a one off production. Um, that she did maintain and sustain that level of interest throughout her life. <laughs> Her ambitions drew her inexorably to the man who would become the great love of her life, Laurence Olivier. There is an extraordinary story that she went to see him in a play and, and declared, you know, that's the man I'm going to marry. And a friend of hers who was with her had to point out, well, actually, you are already married. But this is, is all part of the kind of, um, the sort of ruthless ambition in that, um, you know, various people were to be cast uh, by the wayside um, in those early days until she achieved what she really wanted. Olivier himself tells the story of how um, he was visited by her in the dressing room and she planted a kiss on the back of his neck and um, that was obviously a, a big turning point. Laurence Olivier would become the greatest actor of his generation but at the time he was struggling and he was also married. His wife, Jill Esmond, was pregnant as well but once again Vivian was prepared to go to any lengths to get her man. She knew that he and his wife, Jill Esmond, were holidaying in Capri, and she engineered a holiday there too. She went along with a chaperone called uh, Oswald Fruin, uh, a friend of uh, Lee Holman's, uh, as a kind of cover. And it must have been a very interesting uh, foursome. Jill Esmond certainly knew what was going on. Olivier was afflicted with guilt. Uh, Vivian was like Scarlett O'Hara pursuing her new uh, conquest. And Oswald Fruin was sitting there, really, I suspect, wondering what he'd got himself into. It wasn't very long after that that they were involved in this very long and complicated and furtive affair, um, which, of course, must have been um, exciting on the one hand and riddled with guilt on the other hand. The turning point came when Hamlet was staged in Denmark. And no one quite knows what happened then, but when Laurence Olivier and Vivian returned to England, they quit their respective spices and set up home together. It was a very traumatic thing to do in 1936 or 7. Vivian, you know, threw away the, the, the security of a rich husband, Lee Holman, a safe house, a baby, a nanny, a structure, to go off with Larry, who was at that time not, you know, Sir Laurence Olivier, head of the British theater. He was a struggling actor with also a very difficult romantic past. She went through a lot of agony. Together they bought Durham Cottage as a haven from the public scandal created by their affair. But Vivian's desire for celebrity matched her passion for Olivier. She actively encouraged magazines to publish features on their romantic lifestyle, which fueled their celebrity couple status. She was a great homemaker and she had exquisite taste. She was um, a much more rounded person than Olivier. I mean, he was um, you know, an absolute genius uh, with the stage and, and later on in films. But there wasn't very much more to him than that, I don't think. Whereas Vivian, um, her mind was much more alert to other things. They had this divine little cottage. Vivian was sitting in the little drawing room there. And Mary suddenly said to me, that is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And she truly was. She was quite staggering and uh, even better looking face to face than on the screen because she had this staggering beauty for the eyes and the colouring. She was a wonderful looking woman. In 1938, Olivier headed for his first Hollywood leading role in Wuthering Heights while Vivian was acting on stage in London. It was then that she heard about a new Hollywood talent search, instigated by top MGM producer David O. Selznick for the part of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. 
he literally sent people out, particularly to the southern states of America, going around organizing open auditions where hundreds of would-be southern bells would come in, in costume often, and do their little scarlet turn. Now, as time went on, they realized that they were never going to find anyone in these open calls, and they started seriously testing actresses. Hollywood itself got absolutely fed up with all of this, and Jack Warner himself said to me, oh, you don't want to be in Gone with the Wind. He said, that's going to be the biggest bust in town. Vivian had set her heart on getting the role of Scarlett O'Hara, whatever it took. Vivian read Gone with the Wind like the rest of the world, and she was quite an unknown British actress. By her own admission, not very good. She had been preparing herself for the part for years. She knew passages from the book by heart. This was just her. She believed it was her. She said, you know, I'm going to play Scarlett O'Hara, and <laughs> which is ridiculous. And two years later, she landed the role, which is impossible. She traveled to America to join Olivier, determined to find a way of auditioning for the role. Once in LA, she got Olivia's agent, Myron Selznick, brother of the producer David, to help her. David Selznick was filming the dramatic burning of Atlanta with stand-ins, and as the flames were dying down, Myron arrived on set with Vivian dressed as Scarlett O'Hara. Myron is supposed to have taken Vivian, without David knowing a word about this, to the set, and he is supposed to have said something like, hello, genius, because he teased his brother a lot. Here's your Scarlet. It turned out to be one of the great casting coups of all time. She was right for Scarlet because she was beautiful, because she was fiery, because she was crazy because she submitted to the incredible ordeal of the filming, where she was working nearly every day in heavy costumes under Technicolor lights, which is like shooting in Death Valley in summer. The filming of Gone with the Wind was traumatic for cast and crew. Three separate directors were hired by Selznick. The sets were considered too fake, the early shots were too dark, and the cameraman fired. The script was constantly rewritten moments before scenes were recorded, and the film went massively over budget. 